in exams. Um, I have some knowledge checks. You know, I never use the actual question. I rewrite the questions, but, uh, you know, I've been doing this for now over 20 years and uh, trying to help people pass the test. Uh, for those that are not in the BACSP study group on Facebook, I recommend it because we put probably 1,400, 1,500 questions there now on all the 50 topics that you'll have on your ASP, CSP, CHST. Um, electrical's in five of the exams out of the eight, and so you have to know some of this. Uh, in the CHST, you may have to calculate some Ohm's Law, same as the ASP. The uh, David Yates book is always a good book to have for any of these tests because he covers a lot of the information. The exam core, which is uh, BCSP's uh, $1,000 uh, question uh, study help, uh, is using Yates's second book edition. So uh, even though they say they give the exam on a third, it's interesting, none of the exam questions have reference to thirds. So I always tell people second edition is a little bit cheaper. Well, let's get in started with this. We, what we're looking at is a Dayton fan. We are missing the ground prong, and in the term in electrical is the grounding conductor. In 1929, in the electrical code, they required this third wire ground wire to be put in to take some of the current, and particularly, hopefully, most of it away from the person who might be getting shocked with an electric drill or a metal fan. If you touch this, it's energized. The current's going to go to earth. If you have that third wire, a chunk of it, most of it, will go to earth, and you'll get some shock but hopefully it won't be enough to kill you. Uh, they, the hot wire is what supplies the power from the uh, voltage source. It delivers the current in amps and returns via the neutral or grounded conductor. You can see right off the bat, electrical's got some terms that we don't use in everyday um, language. So they're going to talk about uh, you know, figuring out what is the resistance, the current, the voltage of any kind of uh, information that you might have for an electric circuit. Again, it flows from the voltage source back to the source. Uh, electricity will flow through conductors. All your uh, major metals like uh, gold, silver, copper are great conductors. Uh, silicon, uh, porcelain, ceramic are poor conductors but great insulators. And water, if it's got minerals in it, will be a conductive object. So we have people who have been shocked with wood that's wet, branches that are wet touching power lines. Uh, the term insulator means it's going to be insulated from that electrical force. And, you know, so when you pick up an extension cord, that rubber or that silicon or plastic material is a good insulator. So you have to know the electrical nomenclations. Once uh, every three or four tests in the ESP, uh, they're going to ask you what some of these terms are. For example, They'll give you the rate at which electrical energy is transferred by electric circuit. That is the watt, is what they're looking for. One joule per second. When you see the word one joule per second, a lot of people say, well, I don't know what it is. But usually you're looking for the word power for watts. Current is always going to flow from uh, the, the source back to the source. It's going to be the current that kills you, or and it's going to be measured in amperes or amps. Um, voltage is measured... The force to move these electrons through the wire is called uh, volts or voltage. And uh, those terms you might have to know. So uh, it gets to be tough when you have some of these questions and you've never really understood this. Resistance and impedance are kind of the same thing. But impedance is used in voltage uh, with alternating current. Uh, direct current will have resistance. It'll be measured in ohms for direct current and impedance it will be ohms also but you'll often have to calculate uh, if the resistance is good we want generally under one ohm to be a good current source back to earth if you have high resistance then you're going to be the lower ohms or the lower resistance and a lot of currents going to come through you so ohms law is something you know when i was taking electrical safety you know we spent a lot of time on it uh, it's odd you know they're going to use I instead of A for amps. Voltage is V and R is resistance. And there's a relationship. If you know voltage divided by current is going to get resistance, current times resistance gives you the voltage. So you will get questions. The biggest thing you have to do in these questions is convert it to ohms, volts, and amps. 
a lot of times you'll get the voltage in like a 9 volt, 100 volt, 1000 volts. But the resistance might be in mega ohms, which is 1000 ohms. So 5 mega ohms would be 5000 ohms. Or you'll get current in milliamps. So 100 milliamps is 0 0.1 amps. You have to be able to convert from these milliamps to amps, mega ohms to ohms. And, uh, or excuse me, mega is a million ohms. Kilo ohms is 1,000. But this is, uh, you know, something that a lot of people sweat on the CHST and ASP. But it's, it's not bad. One blank is defined as energy consumption of one joule per electric charge of one coulomb. And they'll tell you it's electromotive force. So let's go into our chat function. You'll see it at the top of your screen or three little dots. What do you think? You can just type in A, B, C, or D what you think the right answer is. And this is, this is a tough question. Remember, we're looking, and the key word is going to be electromotive force. I kind of said it, but you'll, I've got seven terms I talked about real quick. The force. The force. Okay, the answer is voltage. Power is a watt. So, you know, this is where people, you know, are going to have it. And hopefully, if you get stuck, you know it's between a couple things. You know ohms is resistance, current's amps. You may not know the difference of these two. But power is related to voltage. Current times voltage is equal to watts. So, if you get a question where you've got a 5,000 watt generator, and you know it's 120 volts, you can figure out how much current it can put out. Um, the watts are joules per second is equal to volts joules per coulomb times amps per coulomb per second. I've been doing this a long time. I can't remember it. So don't feel bad about it. But they're going to help you out. Current, electromotive force, power. Those are the key words that I look for in the exam. But they're going to go through it. An, an example, um, we have a 60-watt light bulb. uses 60 joules per second. You could actually figure out what the power is, you know. So this is what I run into on the, the CHST and ASP once in a while. And this one is not so bad because it's not in um, milliamps or mega ohms, kilo ohms. But they're going to have to give you an example, and we want to figure out what is the R or the resistance. So we know 10 volts is equal to 2 amps times the resistance. So if we go to our equation, we would write it up as 10 volts equals 2 amps times the resistance, which is R plus 2 ohms. We divide both sides by 5. The answer would be 5 is equal to R plus 2. Subtract 2 from each side. We would be left with 3 ohms of resistance. That is something you have to be able to do. Not easy to do. You have to remember in the ASP exam, you're going to have probably you know, five, six math questions, and same for the CHST. Ten years ago, you had about 20, so it's good. And what did they add differently? They added the incident investigation. They added incident command, violence, uh, law, and other topics. So, you know, what I'm seeing people like on the CSP, it's going to be law and ethics, very tough to get 60%, very tough to get environmental at 60 percent. You want 60 percent in each of the domains and the reason is you pass every time if you get a score of 100 and 305. Last three years I've not seen anybody get scores of 103 and fail. It's usually been 100 but not always. Remember 25 questions are new questions often very bad very hard to understand that would be a new question. You're going to get 25. They don't count what you did on those questions. They're looking at the 175, and if you get 103, you always pass out of 175, which is close to about 60%. And they'll ask you about questions of, uh, you know, what is effective current? Well, you might be able to feel one milliamp. That's one thousandth of an amp. And then at 10, 20 milliamps, you may not be able to let go. I've been there three times. My hand is not being able to let go, even though my body wants to sit there and listen to my brain and say, open your hand and let go of the circuit. It's not possible. At 25 milliamps, your hands actually contract 
and now you've got a grip that uh, often could be lethal. And then ventricular fibrillation or cardiac arrest. For a lot of people, they've never heard of this term. You have to know this term because they may ask you about it. Again, these are not on every question and every test. Like ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest, probably one out of every five tests will have that question. The heart is quivering. It's not pumping blood. Therefore, you must start CPR because the person is really dead. They're not moving the blood. They're not breathing. That's death. So you have to know that. In ventricular fibrillation, you could use a, uh, um, a device that will measure uh, your heart rate. And, uh, you know, this would be an example on the left from an old day, somebody who has ventricular fibrillation. The heart is quivering, the blood isn't moving, they're not breathing. You can have an uh, uh, electrocardiogram, which is this normal heartbeat. That's nice. What I find out, 80% of the people who get shocked, they don't have any of this at the hospital or on any record. So when they get shocked, they, they're going to keep them to verify this gets back to normal over a period of eight hours. And again, you know, the heart is not moving. You have to do CPR. And the ways you protect people are grounding the equipment, uh, using proper insulation so the shock can't get to them. Ground false circuit interrupters, we'll talk a little bit more. When you're going to work on any electrical circuits, you try to de-energize it. Try to verify that it's dead and won't have any kind of unexpected power. Uh, you want to make sure your tools and equipment are inspected and, and made sure the cords are good, the grounding prong is there if it's got a three-wire. Uh, you're using the right equipment. You're not using something that's designed for 1,000 volts for power, and, and you're up at something that's going to be a lot more than that. You know, every equipment you use to test equipment has a rating, and uh, you have to make sure. it. If you're going to work around electrical and all your boxes from one 240 to 480 panels should have a label telling you there's an arc flash hazard. And PPE is going to depend what you're doing. If you're going to work on live 240 or 480, you will be a qualified person. That's somebody who's had extensive training and knows how to protect themselves. They will wear electrical arc flash clothing at Category 2. Now, if you, if you don't know what Category 2 is, you're going to have to do installation. What should you do before starting maintenance or repairs? Wear protective gloves and goggles. Turn off the power supply at the circuit. Ask a friend to help you. Keep water and other liquids nearby for emergencies. So we can go to our chat and type what we think is right. Okay. And some of these are always good. But, you know, the main thing you want to do is very good. We want to turn off the power supply. And then we verify it. Now I'm going to shut off the screen one more time. If I can do this right here. We want to use tools like voltage detectors. This is one. Uh, there's several companies. Fluke, Ideal. And this would be able to sense. If you notice, this one has got a, a, a blinking red light that's going to be out there, be able to tell if the outlet is alive. So if I do this here real quick. I've got this. This circuit is live. You can tell this orange light. And I could actually put it in here in the hot wire. And it's going to light up and go. One of the insurance companies told me this morning the employee was cutting an extension cord they thought was dead. And, of course, they got shocked and hurt when they found out the 120 volts. And then under electrical safety of OSHA, they have to be trained to use something like this to verify that extension cord is dead. You could use a receptacle tester. You could use this. You could use a multimeter. There's different versions. But you got to make sure before you're going to cut electrical, it is dead. And everybody who's doing work that has to involve that has to have some kind of training. Okay, so let's move this away. So we want to work live if it's absolutely necessary, but otherwise shut it off. So here he's going to work on the lights of an electrical cord. We're going to find out it's live. He does not have electrical gloves. That's no good. So we want to have it. 
These instruments, like the multimeters, have an insulated probe. That's not sufficient. You'd want to wear electrical gloves if you're working on 120, and after 240 and higher, you also want to add arc flash equipment. Insulated gloves are sold. Uh, they're made of a rubberized material. Uh, they're good for the voltage rating on the glove. If it says double zero, it's good for 500 volts. Class zero gloves are 1,000 volts. Class one is 10,000 volts. Two is 20,000 and so on. You measure it by the hand size, so you need a, what they call a cloth tape. And they come in half size. So I wear size nine, and I would buy a set of gloves. You also have to make sure you test these gloves on a periodic basis. Can anybody type in the chat how often you have to test electrical gloves if you have given it to your people to work with? How often would you have to test the electrical gloves? Because some people know it, but a lot of people do not. Oops, sorry. I'm going to have to stop and scare your screen for a second. Every six months, every six months, and then you inspect it every day. You know, so that that's a test question they might ask you. And you know, these are this is where it gets tougher in the area. So let's get in here and take a look at some of the other issues. Guarding of electrical has to be there for when the voltage is over 50 feet, uh, 15 volts. This is a common question. You know, almost all the exams will start to explore this, and I did something I did not want to do. Okay. Well, all right. If it's over 50 volts or more, you have to have some kind of uh, enclosure around that piece of equipment. All your power tools that today that are plugged in would have the motor control by that method. The voltage detectors, they sense the steady state electrostatic field by the produced by AC voltage. It will not work on DC voltage in most cases. It will not be able to pick up through metal conduit because that interferes with the ability to detect it. So you might have to open up the conduit and then tell if the wires are there. But the idea is that this is going to be in device. This one has a range of 600 volts maximum. So you don't want to be testing a 2,000 volt pump on a uh, uh, circuit and have this thing blow up because it's not rated for the voltage. The ground loop impedance tester, every five tests, they ask you about what this item is. This is an expensive item. It's a couple hundred dollars. It measures the impedance or the resistance to the earth. Ideally, we want to have about one ohms of resistance. 0.8 is perfect. A little bit less than that is even better. But if you have areas that, if you're like in the desert areas, you drive a, a, a metal rod to earth it, earth the area or the house, you may have to go down 10, 20, 30 feet before there's enough uh, resistance that's going to be there for you to be able to get the current through in a case of emergency. If you put it in pure sand, you could have thousands of ohms resistance. That means it's not going to go to earth. It's not there. You're going to need something that's going to be in there. When they install these grounding rods, they can measure the resistance to earth through the circuits, and, and hopefully we get around about one ohm or so. This one was at 1.39 ohms. But that's what it's doing. It's measuring the impedance or the resistance of that circuit. And again, when you're using the cords, you've got to inspect it every day by OSHA. Every day, the, any portable tools and equipment like vacuum cleaners and stuff, you just take a look at the cords and make sure they're in good condition like this. You're not allowed to make homemade boxes and extension cords like you see on the left. That's be used as not approved. In 1971, the National Electric Code required any damp and wet location to have a ground fault circuit interrupter. We call it a GFCI. This GFCI senses the difference of the incoming current or the hot current to the tool and the returning current, the neutral or grounded conductor. If it's more, it's performing calibration on your air handling unit. That's a unit that heats and cools your factory or your facility. The work is limited to the control system, which is rated 110 volts AC, alternating current. What is the best? You'll see these things capitalized. There's a lot of good ones, but which one do they think is the best description of the hazard? And this is a tough question. Test equipment is fully insulated. There's no risk. B, less than 110 volts AC can cause severe burns to skin tissue. C, voltage is secondary period. 
current above 75 milliamps may cause ventricular fibrillation. And D, only voltages exceeding 480 volts is hazardous. This is very tough. And let's just take a look at our responses here. What do we got? Oh, we got a couple people who already got it. I'll give you a couple more seconds. Because this, this one is, is like really testing your knowledge. And the answer is indeed C. So the test equipment is fully insulated. That's the voltage tester. That doesn't mean if I'm working on 110 with no gloves, no protection, there is a risk because you can get electrocuted at 110 volts. Less than 100 can cause severe burns. No. Your arc flashes occur at 480 for the most part. There's been one arc flash I can document it at 240. But less than 110, you're not going to get an arc flash. You're not going to get severe burns. You get shock, but you're not going to get a severe explosion or severe burns. Current above 75. Remember, 50 to 200 milliamps can cause ventricular fibrillation. You've got to remember that range. And then 480 volts. Remember the OSHA rule, 50 volts or more is hazardous. So this one's got like four different topics in it that you have to know. And in this case, this one is going to be the correct answer. When you got electrical outlets near your sinks and your water fountains, they have to be how many feet away? I didn't make this a test question, but I bet you somebody knows. Can you type in the chat what you think? How many feet away does this have to be from the electric outlet? It's not a, it's not a GFCI outlet. It's just a regular outlet. Anybody know how far it has to be from your water sources, like a fountain, a sink, or something else? The answer by the National Electric Code is very good, Maria. Six feet. Six feet. You're going to be, you could look all day long. Remember, OSHA will often reference the National Electric Code because they have in the beginning of the electrical standard, electrical equipment must be of safe design and use. And that's how they just say you didn't follow the electrical code, which is six feet away. You cannot use electrical tape like this person did at the factory to repair a cord because it doesn't have the same insulation. It's not waterproof now. Uh, you can replace an end cord and do it, but you just cannot take tape because electrical tape is there for only temporary use and uh, just to prevent some live parts. But you need to really unplug it and replace the cord. And if the wiring is more than 90 days, this is temporary wiring, any extension cord, any outlet strip, you're using, you're not supposed to have it there for 10, 15 years. So in the electrical code, remember all the OSHA standards came from the National Electric Code, the National Fire Protection Association out of Massachusetts is the one that coordinates the electric code. There's over 700 members in the National Electric Code. The safety code is called NFPA 70E by that group. But you can't have more than 90 days of temporary electric. If you're going to be keep on plugging it into these outlets, they expect you to bring an electrician and put real outlets in. So, you know, how long can temporary wiring be used? The answer, 90 days. And again, you get the manufacturer's rules. Under OSHA, equipment has to be a safe design and use, and the manufacturer will tell you, you're going to press the test button every month. Every month, somebody's going to go check it. So that's a good job for somebody in the safety committee. Uh, go out and verify your GFCIs are working like I showed you before. And this one is the number one cited item for electrical safety by OSHA the last three years in a row. You know, my, when I was doing work with OSHA, it wasn't in the top three. It was like nine, ten or so. Here's our electrical panel box. What is the hazard here? This is at one of the largest fast food restaurants in the country. What is the hazard? It says you have to have three feet of clear space. They've blocked it with boxes. You can't put a shelf, you can't put a machine, you can't put a pallet in front of that box because it has to be accessible if you need to shut off the power in an emergency. So this is the number one. How much clear space do you have to have in a panel? That's a common question. Three feet. And these are... Can I have a question? Yes. Can the manufacturing is worse? Um, there's always a lot of kickback because we'll have the um, defined walking aisleways, Correct. but there will be a panel box on it. So all that walkway that needs the equipment on the other side of the walkway, 
So you've got, first of all, you've only got 28 or 30 inches between. Secondly, it's feeding the equipment, and the excuse is always you have nowhere else to put it. Well, you maybe need a bigger place. I mean, you can't have a block. I mean, that's that's from, you know, the electricians who made the electrical code. And their solution is, you know, you could hire us and we can move the machinery and put it in more of an efficient design. But you cannot put it in front of the panel box because you're in violation. You know, if you want to deviate from it, you really need an engineer who's going to say, oh, this is okay. It isn't, OSHA would never give you a break on it because they're saying it all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and again, people... Who get shocked it's seconds before they die so every second you have to move something get it out of the way is potentially going to cause somebody to die and that's that's probably the part of the circus that you know you can go through and you know they'll look at it but this is a you know this is a rule it's not made by OSHA it's made by the electrical people they came up with it OSHA just adopted it so they're pretty pretty sympath you know sympathetic you know you, you definitely have to move it Power lines kills everybody once a week. There's once a week somebody hits these power lines. Sometimes two die. The record is four in China where they hit it with a scaffold and all four people holding the scaffold died. Uh, this is easy to prevent. You can put signs. That's what I always do. Power line ahead. Do not store any equipment. Alexa, stop. Do not store any equipment in the area. Because if you put a trailer, Alexa, stop. If you get something in the area, like a trailer full of heavy-duty equipment on top, now to get this off, you might use a crane or a forklift, and it's going to hit this power line. We had a case in 1999 in Illinois where the forklift hit the item. It caught the forklift on fire, and he jumped out. And by having his legs apart, what they call the voltage gradient killed him. And then two co-workers see this person drop, a young boy, like 25 years old. They run to him, and they die when they step on the voltage gradient. Because the current comes out here, and then it gets weaker and weaker as it gets away from the power line source. But that's, you know, three dead. So what is the number one cause of electrical death? Power lines. Overwhelmingly, 70% of the deaths usually. Again, equipment has to be approved. You know, a lot of people think of a, a, a national laboratory like UL, Factory Mutual. There's a lot of different laboratories. But if you make equipment and you want it to meet the electrical listing, you're going to have to have it tested at one of 30 recognized laboratories. So, again, we cannot make homemade extension cords. Everybody needs to have some electrical training in a factory. And they talk about, at a minimum, have to know what kind of PPE to wear, and have some training and skills detect live parts. So, like I said, when this person is going to cut an electrical cord, you know, one, an extension cord, then they got to make sure it's 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 unplugged, not live. You could use a voltage detector. You could track this cord. This was a long cord. That's the reason they didn't track it down. It went through a couple areas, and they just said, "Well, it's dead. It's somebody unplugged it." Well, you know, you can't look at the cord and see electricity. That's the trouble. So who needs this? Well, every supervisor, anybody with electronic in their title, every machine operator, every forklift operator, everybody in the mechanic shop, maintenance shop, painters, riggers, engineers, and welders need some kind of electrical safety training. So this is actually a requirement in the OSHA rules. And, and this is probably the number one training area for most companies to miss. OSHA person says, let me see your electrical safety training for your maintenance people, your forklift operators, your welders. And they, they look at you like, what? I don't have any. Where does it say that? Well, 1910, 334 has that requirement. And again, cords and cables, you've got to watch out because if things run over it, it's going to damage that cord. That cord is not designed for you know a 4,000-pound area lift to run over it. It's not designed for being pinched in doorways, run through the walls. It's designed just to give you temporary power. Okay, ground fault circuit interrupter, another one. This is a, we already kind of covered a little bit, but the ground fault circuit interrupter prevents shock by quickly shutting off power to the circuit if electricity flow in a circuit differs by a slight amount from that returning. B, it's designed to allow circuit current through the circuit, but in the event the circuit exceeds some maximum value, it would open, severing the circuit. C, it offers additional paths for the electrical circuit 
to flow into the earth so not to endanger anyone working with electricity nearby in the event of a short circuit. And D, so named, they have the ability to measure the multiple uh, variables, voltage, current, resistance. So what do you think? Let's type our answer in. Give you a second or two. Very good. Everybody's doing right. A is the answer. It's going to shut it off in a 40th of a second when it's about 5 milliamps. You might feel 5 milliamps, but it ain't going to kill you. Number B is a circuit breaker. That's the definition of a circuit breaker, which you could imagine that could be the question also. And then the grounding conductor or the ground pin is going to be the additional path. So you takes the current. Hopefully most of it will go that way. And then the multimeter or uh, the other devices would be the examples of D. So again, one of these things that happens, they could have these same four answers and they just change the question, what is a circuit breaker? What is a grounding conductor? And these, then the answer would be, well, you know, goes from B for a circuit breaker, C for a grounding conductor. And that's what they, they can get a lot of times, three questions out of one set of answers. And you will get a GSI question. That's almost always predictable. Some form, somewhere, you'll get a GSI question. Uh, cords cannot, again, be repaired with electrical tape. Again, the integrity. This electrical cord has hard insulation. It's been tested as abrasion resistant, thermal resistant. But once you break it, these inner wires, not tested at all. They're very weak. You could cut the insulation with your fingertip, usually. And again, if you pull the wires out from a circuit box, this is called a lack of strain relief. Now these wires can cut into that metal and energize that metal box or cut the grounding conductor and now we don't have protection at our tool or our equipment. So you have to do this inspection. These are called knockouts. These things are bent. There's not supposed to have any opening. We don't want to have any dust, any water, and everything else. In the food industry, they use water all the time to clean up equipment. That's not good. Let me mute somebody real quick. All right. Working live. Remember, you're going to be within 42 inches. NFPA 70 says now you're exposed. If you're going to work on 240, 480, or higher, you must be a qualified person. Qualified person is somebody who's been trained through extensive experience, experience, degree, to know how to do the stuff right. So you have to work in a machine panel. This is very common at 480 volts. This is very much all live. People don't get afraid of this because nothing is buzzing, nothing is there. But if you just drop your screwdriver across these two uh, bus bars, you can get a big explosion, which they call an arc flash. So number, uh, uh, the most uh, arc flashes occur when I've done the research at 480 volts. I have one minor one at 240, never one at 110. I know NFPA talks about it, but I've asked them, show me the case, because I've been doing this for years, and I've never seen a 110 arc flash. It might just might make a bzzz. That's not an arc flash. That's just a buzz. But we want to go in there. 42 inches is a magic number. You must be qualified. You must be wearing arc flash. You must have gloves. You must have face shield, everything. And again, the voltage tester we discussed. The detector will not work through conduit. They always tell you test it on something like a lamp cord to verify it works before you test it on something that you might cut that you might kill you if it's wrong. Because every instrument will fail eventually. You know, they don't last forever. The ground loop impedance tester is used to test what? The amps in the circuit, the resistance in the grounding wire, the watts in the system, the voltage to earth. Type in A, B, C, or D. Okay, very good. The answer is indeed the resistance or impedance in the grounding wire. The arc flash, heat of the sun as I call it, less than about a tenth of a second, that forces the current through the air. And 80% of the uh, electrical injuries from contact ignition clothing. That's for like arc flashes. Remember, power lines, number one course, cause of death. When you get hit with that molten metal, that copper that's a room temperature in a tenth of a second, it's molten copper, 
you're going to get skin grafts. If you block it with your hand like that guy did, they've got to do it. And it's almost always a million dollars because you're not going to just sew the skin on and go back to work. It's got to be, a, you know, it's got to graft to your skin and attach. So this is going to take a period of, you know, weeks, if, if not a year, depending on how much you burn, or even some people, two to three years. You know, they've got to scrub the skin. It's got to attach. It's got to grow. And this is why it's expensive. Uh, five to ten arc flash incidents a day per NFPA. Uh, last year, we had a record low four arc flashes. This is all I could find last year in 2022, which is good. Because we used to have dozens of these a year back in 1990 when this standard was going to be enforced by OSHA. And, of course, the sign standard talks about telling people of the hazard. This is what they required in 2002. In damp locations, what will protect the worker if the three-wire tool shorts out by interrupting the current flow? Well, this is a different way. Instead of asking what it is, now we're going to ask you what would, would the device be. Ground loop impedance capacitor, grounding cable rated 2 ohms, ground fault circuit interrupter, ground fault circuit tester. Boy, everybody got that one right. The answer is C, ground fault circuit interrupter. Like I said, you're always going to get a ground fault circuit interrupter question in some form. Today, the National Electric Code, since 2014, they want to tell you it's 480 volts. You're going to wear a certain amount of electrical equipment. It's always going to be a Category 2. It would never be a Category 0 or flash hazard 0. But they're going to tell you, you're within 42 inches, you got to be qualified. You're going to wear that equipment. This is when you're working on 2,000, 4,000 volts. This is Category 3 and 4. The causes of electrical uh, arc flashes, I see a lot of corrosion. You know, these places nowadays, 100 years, that electrical circuit's there. Uh, you wash the area down with water inside, it's rusted and out. So it, it, it depends. I've seen tools drop, causing the arc flash. Uh, shaking it, even taking the cover off can cause an arc flash. So you're going to wear the helmet, the face shield, the balakava, it's like a ninja mask. The arc flash suit, electrical gloves with arc flash uh, leather gloves or rated gloves. You're not going to be out there without the balakava. You know, when they started in 1991, they didn't require this. And then I showed them all these people who turned aside, got skin grafts, burns on the side. Because not everybody, like, faces the arc flash straight on. A lot of people turn their head. So this, you know, balakava, maybe $50 to $100 for our Category 2. He's going to rack out the breakers in a power plant. That's going to be category three or four, depending on what this voltage is. Because now, instead of a tenth of a second, it's going to be a five-second arc flash. And you're going to be able to stand this wall of flame and hopefully get out and live with nothing more than a couple blisters at worst. They go through the categories of the, the material. They rate them by, you know, calories per uh, square centimeter. You know, they're not going to ask you that, thankfully. But Category 2 is what you wear at 480. The best they got right now is Category 4. You can layer it up if you get higher voltages. But you got to know what it is. You're going to go to a panel box in a factory. It's probably 480, Category 2. The NFPA code to protect workers from arc flashes is NFPA what? Seventy e so I always tell people there's an online 70E class from NFPA. You can take it at a lot of safety places. Uh, different universities have classes. It's a good example of a class. Usually it's only about four hours long. Any questions? Right on time, 42 minutes, so pretty good. Here we're looking at no grounding prong. Here we made a homemade box, made an extension core, hung it in the air. That's no good. Again, missing grounding prong, damage extension cord. Our knockout is missing here. And this is more than 90 days. When you got all that wire, you know somebody got it there for years. So like I said, I'm on LinkedIn. Please add me if you haven't added me already. I also uh, post uh, three questions every day on the BCPSE study guide. Um, I, I work with a lot of people trying to help everybody. My goal is hopefully get 200,000 trained safety people by 2023. But I appreciate everybody coming in and... I'll hope to have another one next month. It looks like environmental has been really tough, so I'll, I'll try to get environmental or law or ethics next month. Testing frequency of gloves, six months. 1910, 138 or so. Okay, we'll call it a day. Thank you.